Praise the Lord. It's extra long fellowship time this morning, but we got a lot of guests to greet. A lot, not guests, brothers and sisters to greet. And um, we, we are so honored to have with us all of our guests. And um, we, we want to hear from them, as many of them, as the Lord would place something on their heart. And uh, we want to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. Amen. Uh, the first person we want to hear from this morning is Brother David Laser. Am I pronouncing that right? David Laser. Um, we came in contact with him maybe a year ago, somewhere in that range. Seven months. Okay, a few months ago then, six, six months, a year, something like that, um, on Facebook. And um, has been a blessing having conversations back and forth with him. And he is up in North Carolina this weekend visiting family and had opportunity to, to swing over to North Carolina. So we want to hear whatever the Lord would put on his heart. Would you welcome Brother Laser to speak to us this morning? Well, praise the Lord, church. Uh, I'm excited to be here this morning and excited for the opportunity to just share a little bit. And um, I, I don't want to talk too long, but just kind of give you all a little bit of my testimony. And, and uh, I, I'm just very excited to be in this place today. Y'all have no idea just how much um, y'all's ministry has had an impact upon my life in Alabama. And so just keep doing what y'all are doing. And and keep serving the Lord the way that y'all are serving him. Um, when Brother Brantley, he asked me to, to share, I, I did want to share my testimony with y'all, but there was a thought that was with um, my testimony that I wanted to share, and I just wanted to talk about us hearing the voice of God. Um, I've grew up in church all of my life, uh, and I thank God that I had a mom that, that kept me in the house of the Lord. Um, maybe the places that I went didn't have full understanding of everything, but just the fact that I was in a place where the word of God was being spoken over my life and that I had a, a mom that was praying that I would be used of the Lord. And um, so just to start off, I, I, I grew up in a Baptist church, and um, I w like I said, I was in church all my life. I called upon the Lord when I was 14 years old, and I, I believe that he honored that. Um, and God just started to move in my life, even, even at a very young age. But I remember there were some things that happened in the church that I was going to, and I ended, up, I ended up getting out of church when I was like 18 years old. I got married outside of the Lord, and, uh, and I just started to live my own life. But there was, always that, there was always something there that was drawing me back uh, to God. There was always, I remember there was times that I would turn on the radio and God would just speak or, or be speaking to me through the radio, and I would shut it off because I didn't want to hear it. Uh, I didn't want to live for God. I wanted to do my own thing. Um, but there came a time uh, I was living in Florida, and I, I was going to be flying out of town um, to do a, some job training. And it was the first time I had ever flown, and I had a dream that night. And on the, in the dream, I was in, on a plane, and I was flying, but all of a sudden the plane started to go down. And I remember that I wanted to cry out to God, and I wanted to ask him for forgiveness. But I couldn't say anything. I couldn't speak. And, um, and so I woke up from the dream, and, and I was afraid because I was like, I, God wasn't showing me that day that, he was gonna, that I was going to die or anything like that. But the, the point of the dream was I wasn't going to be able to call on him when I chose to call on him. But I needed to call on him when he was drawing me or when he was calling me. And, uh, but nonetheless, you know, just because of my stubbornness, I still got on the plane in any way without uh, making things right with the Lord. But uh, I ended up going through a, a divorce. And um, in that time, it was, it was the hardest time of my life. Um, but it was actually one of the greatest times of my life because that was the moment that I really gave myself to God. I was 23 years old. Um, I didn't have I didn't have nowhere to go. I didn't have uh, anybody to turn to, you know, but but God. And so I gave my life to the Lord. I say I really surrendered to the Lord at that point when I was 23. 
And, and I, was, I remember praying at that particular time. I was like, God, I've grew up in church all my life. Uh, I've been around the hypocrisy and things like that. And I said, but I don't want to be a hypocrite. I want to be the same David I am at church as the same David I am on my job, as the same David I am around my family. I want to be that same David that lives for you. And uh, I remember my main prayer was I asked God, I said, show me the truth because the truth is what's going to make me free. And I said, and I'm not free. And so it was, it was after that that I really began to seek the Lord. And um, I remember I started reading the New Testament, and I just I couldn't put it down. It was like it was, it was just feeding me every time I picked it up. I remember I was reading like 10 and 12 chapters at a time, and I just couldn't stop. And I was like, man, I've been in church all my life, and I just I've never seen it like this. But it was because there was a hunger in me that God was just feeding me. And I remember in that moment, you know, that I was seeking the Lord, he, he was really showing me about the accountability of my life. Because I had been around so much hypocrisy, he was saying, you are accountable for the way that you live. I have called you to live your life a certain way. And so it was in that moment that I gave my life to the Lord, really, and just began to live for God. And, and just that journey for truth has been amazing because, um, you know, I met my wife. Uh, she lived in Alabama. And she was actually part of a apostolic church. Um, so when we got married, you know, I never heard of the apostolics. You know, I was Baptist, you know, all my life. And so I was like, oh, it's just another, another denomination, nothing to it. And, um, you know, as I began to sit down and they were going through Bible studies with me and begin to show me, like, the plan of salvation, uh, being baptized in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost, you know, God began to, began to prick my heart over those things. And I remember he used uh, one day in particular, I was really struggling with the issue of baptism, and um, I'm driving down the road, and I'm telling, uh, we, we had actually went and was knocking on doors, you know, inviting people to the church and praying with them, and we actually prayed with one guy, and we prayed the sinner's prayer with him, and when I left, I just felt like, I was like, God, I feel like he, he needed more, and I was like, and I was telling him, I was like, I don't want to I don't want to lead people in the wrong direction. I don't want to give people false information. You know, I want to share the truth with people. And so I was in this battle, like, whether this was true or whether it was not. And I remember I, I prayed, and I'm driving down the road. You know, my wife, she's talking to the lady that's with us. And I was like, God, is, is, is baptism necessary? Well, he speaks to my heart, and he says, Acts chapter 8. You know, I'm pulling over in the gas station. They're going in to get a drink. And I just open up my Bible to Acts chapter 8. It's a long chapter, but I turn right to where the, he, he has his encounter with the eunuch. And the Bible simply says that he preached to him Jesus. Well, his first question that he asked after the preaching was, what hinders me from being baptized? You know, here's water. And so when I read that, you know, God said, it's necessary. And so I knew, you know, from that moment, it was like, you know, I heard the voice of God speak into my life, and I knew that it was true. You know, I'd had men telling me that it was true. I had been reading it that it was true, but it wasn't, it wasn't until God said it's necessary. It wasn't until I knew that I heard the voice of the Lord that it really clicked in, in my heart. And so I know the, during the temptation of Jesus, the enemy tempts him, and, and one of the things he quotes back to him, he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so it's not just about what we read all the time. But it's about that we really have an encounter with God. We really connect with God in the spirit. And uh, I just heard uh, your message from last week. And it really was a blessing to me because it was just talking about that. You know, it was talking about uh, the spirit man connecting with the spirit of God. And I believe that's where we're, that's where we're truly going to hear the voice of God. And that's where that cleansing that you were talking about is going to take place from the inside out. And so from, from those moments, I have just... I know the voice of God in my life, and um, there's been times where God would speak, and I was afraid, you know, because it was something that I that I'd never heard before. But it was, you know, God was challenging me. You know, was I going to follow Him or was I going to follow man? And you know, I want to be the one that's going to follow Him above the the teachings and the doctrines of men. And I think that even even in the understanding that we have now. We still need to have ourselves in that position to where that, God, if, if my understanding is not right, if my understanding is wrong, am I willing to hear a word from you and to correct that? No matter if anybody else agrees with it or not, am I willing to hear you 
and to listen to you and to follow you. And so I remember last year in, um, in September, I was, uh, as I was waking up one morning, I heard the Lord speak to my heart. And he said, uh, Genesis 22.3. And I just kind of was like, well, maybe that's just my mind. And, you know, I just kind of went back to sleep. But again, as I was waking up, I heard him say Genesis 22.3. And so I was like, well, I need, to, I need to look at it. I need to read it. And so I read it, and it says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place of which God had told him. And, and the moment I read that, the Lord spoke to my heart, and he said, are you willing to go to the place where I would have you to go? Are you willing to follow my voice where I would lead you to go? And that morning, I remember I just told God, I said, yes, you know, I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing to go, and I just got on my knees and just began to pray unto the Lord that way. And I didn't know, you know, what all God was going to be doing. I didn't understand what all was uh, about to take place. And I knew that he wasn't going to be taking me, like, to another country or something like that. But I knew it was going to be a journey through his word. Well, it wasn't long after that, maybe a couple months or so, I began to do a study on the book of John, um, 1 John. And so as I'm reading it, it's only five chapters, but they're so, it's so powerful, that book. And, and as I was reading through this book, I start noticing... Um, the very strong language of John about how those that are born of God do not sin. Uh, those that are of the devil sin. You know, they continue in sin. And, you know, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, I've grew up in church all my life. Uh, and, yeah, you know, they tell us there's freedom from sin, you know, through Jesus Christ. But they're always also adding on that but, you know, but, you know, that you're still human. And um, that's always going to be part of you. You're always going to be falling into sin so it's like they lift you up and encourage you that you're going to come out and then just to tear you down and say well it's always going to happen but when I was reading this book I was like God you're speaking strongly that no it doesn't happen and so I was like you know help me to understand how that can be you know because I believed in living a life of holiness I believed in in walking to the Lord but yet I still had my own struggles and I would kind of you know I would kind of rub them off as many do as oh, I'm just human and I'm in the process and I'm growing, but there was something about these scriptures that were just like really pricking my heart and really convicting me that it was more than just saying I'm in the process, but there's, there was actually a turning that was going to have to be taking place in my life, a literal turning away. That's what, that's what true repentance is. It's not just, I don't just come before the Lord and ask the Lord for forgiveness, but I'm asking the Lord for forgiveness, and I'm telling the God I'm not going to do that again. I see how it offends you. I see how it offends my brother. And so I want to love you and I want to love them. And I'm going to walk in the things that you are showing me. And so I asked God to help me to understand that. Well, as I was reading through, um, the first chapter talks about that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And it says that we, if we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, it said that we lie and we're not doing the truth. And so what I was seeing from that is that God is light. And, you know, just, just as my journey throughout life, he reveals light to us at, at points and times in our life. And it's in those moments that we have the responsibility to walk in that light. So it wasn't so much about understanding all things or knowing all things as much as it was walking in what we understand and walking in what we know that God has led us to. And I think the fear that most people have is, is that they're, they're not perfect or they don't want to make that commitment and be hypocrites. But the thing is, is we don't have to be hypocrites. Just walk in what you know to walk in. You know, if all you know is you, you, you just first come to the Lord and, and God is showing you, you know, drop that foul language. Well, drop the foul language. You know, it's, it's very easy. It's not, we're, not, we're not ignorant people. We're grown people. And so when God speaks to us, we're, we can very easily make a right decision. I mean, when we correct our kids that are, like my son's seven and eight years old, we expect him to do right, and they're seven. How much more for God to expect from us to do right when he reveals it to us? It's not hard for me to, to not look upon another woman and lust after her because I know that the Lord tells me not to. It's not hard for me to not uh, hate my brother and, and, and commit murder in my heart because I know that the Lord doesn't want that from me. And, and we can do that through his, through his strength and knowing the word. And just 
you know, humbling ourselves and getting rid of a little bit of pride, you know, and laying that aside and just saying, you know, God, even though I don't understand all things at times, I understand what you're telling me to do, and I'm going to do it. And, um, and it's when we begin to walk in those things that he can actually give us more of that light that he's talking about. And um, so as I, as I begin to go through the first John the second time, what was standing out to me the next time was that it kept saying the spirit of Antichrist was that if you don't believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Well, you know, all my life growing up, I just thought that mean if you say that Jesus didn't exist, you know, that was the spirit of Antichrist. And so I began to pray and I began to ask God, I was like, help me to understand um, your, I was saying, help me to understand humanity in relationship to your spirit, because I still wasn't under the right understanding, but I was just praying in that direction. So as I began to just read through the word, just things were standing out to me, showing me who this man, Christ Jesus, was, and that he really was a true man and yielded himself unto his father. And when, I begin, when that began to open up to me, I saw, okay, God, I, that's why you're telling me that I can be perfect. That's why you're telling me that I can be holy. That's why you're telling me that I don't have to sin. Because you gave your son to show me that. And so when I began to see who, truly who Christ was, it was like all of the word of God just began to open up to me. And all of the word of God just began to mean something to me. You know, there were so many times that I read scripture and was like, you know, I could understand it on the outside, but it wasn't able to get into my heart. It wasn't able to change my life. And it was because I didn't truly know who Christ was. And so I just want to encourage y'all today, you know, to, to hear the voice of the Lord. You know, place yourself in a position that where God, if I'm not seeing something right, if I'm not understanding, when you speak that I would be willing to listen, that I would be willing to follow outside of what man is maybe speaking into my life, that I will be willing to love you above man. I know the word of God, one of the scriptures that's helped me, because I've went through several transitions, you know, coming out of the Baptist church, going into a Pentecostal church, going into an apostolic church, now, you know, coming into this understanding of the Son of God. There's been a lot of transition. You know, my, my wife, you know, she told me one day, she said, you don't, you don't know everything, and she was right. You know, I don't know everything, but the thing that we do need to know is we need to know the voice of God. You know, it's good to come to church, and it's good to hear a man of God like Brother Brantley to speak the word of God and to receive that, but you need to know the voice of God in your own life because men are capable of falling. I've been in ministries where men stumbled and fell, and I had them on such a, I had them on such a high place that they were almost God to me. And when they fell, it, it, it crushed me, you know, and it tore me apart. And it was because I wasn't hearing the voice of God, I was letting the man be the voice of God in my life. We can let men speak into our life, but it needs to be the spirit of God that is speaking through them to bring understanding. Because that's really the only way that we're truly going to gain understanding. Because even a man that, that speaks the word of God with power if you receive that understanding from man, the moment another man comes along and has a more persuasive argument or, you know, his words are a little more eloquent than the other one, well, now you're confused again. Now you don't know. But if you know that you heard the voice of God in your life, there's nothing any other man can say to change what you know. And so that's, that's where I'm at today is there are some things that God has definitely spoken into my life, and there is nothing that any man can say to change that. But I'm also at the point in my life where God, if I have received a doctrine from man, if I have received an understanding from someone outside of your will, correct that in me. You know, I'm willing to change. I'm willing to bow down to your word and to love your word and your spirit above all else. And so I, I thank y'all for the opportunity, you know, just to let me come and, and to share a little bit of my, my testimony with y'all. And again, I thank you, Brother Brantley, and I thank you for this ministry, for the impact that y'all have had upon my life. Um, you, Brother Dolson, and, and your father, you may not know, but I, I mean, I read y'all's uh, messages, and, and there's such an impact on my life. Brother Daniel as well, uh, it's been a blessing to just, be, just to know you uh, since coming to this understanding. And I just thank y'all, and thank y'all for this fellowship and such a wonderful presence of the Lord in this place this morning. Thank you very much.
Amen. What a blessing that is to know that God is speaking, moving. Spirit of truth is in operation. Truly a blessing to have Brother David with us and his, his wife, Sister Lupe, and their beautiful children. And uh, we also have with us this morning, and this is the first time I'm meeting Brother David and Brother uh, Daniel Santangelo from uh, face to face. We've talked on Facebook, but I want to give uh, Brother Daniel an opportunity at this point if he'll come and, and tell us what's on his heart. And um, he has a similar testimony, I believe, but I'll let him get into that. Welcome, Brother Daniel Santangelo. He's from Asheville, North Carolina. Thank you, Brother Brentley. Before, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ryan. Before I say anything, I just want to say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know how good it feels to say that? It feels so good to be able to say that without, like, having to explain yourself, like, wait a minute, there's a dual name going on there, you know. Oh, man, it feels great. Um, I wasn't expecting to get up here. I'm just, I'm just going to come and have fellowship with you fine people here. But, um, yeah, so I, 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 I live in Waynesville, North Carolina, about four hours away. I, I woke up at six, or 5.30 this morning, left around 6.15, 6.30. Try to get here as quickly as possible. Too quickly because I got a speeding ticket on the way here. So, but hey, it's worth it, right? This is worth it. So, uh, my testimony: I uh, I did not grow up in Apostolic Pentecostal churches. My mom took me to Baptist churches, Seventh Day Adventist churches. Um, those are the two churches. I just, I mean, just you just went to church to so go to church because that's what you did as a kid, right? I grew up in the world. I would say. I mean, I was, yeah, I was. No, I wasn't really bad, but I was, you know, I was worldly. And so God, I, when I was 13 years old, I read the book of Revelation for the, like, that was the first book in the Bible I ever read. I don't know why, I just wanted to read it. And I really felt like when I was 13 that God was speaking to me, like, look, you got you to gotta live for me. I mean, this is truth. The word of God is truth. You got to live for me. And, you know, this is going to happen if you don't. Like, all, you know, to read Revelation, it's, it just freaks you out. It scares you to death. And so, you know, I'm reading that book. And I start crying, and, uh, you know, just, you know, I just I always have that in the back of my mind. Like, you know, I always believed in God. You know, I always believed in Jesus, whatever that meant back then. I don't know. Um, so I, I came to the Pentecostal Apostolic Church through a ministry, through end time ministries, through Urban Baxter. I'm not sure if you guys know who he is. Well, you know, you go to college and people are like doubting the Bible. Yeah, the word of God is not truth. You can't believe it evolution, you know, creation is false, and I'm thinking to myself, no, I know the Bible's true, I, I know there's a God, and I kind of just stumbled across his ministry, and started listening to his end time prophecy stuff, and he was all over the book of Revelation, I'm like, man, this is awesome stuff, I can actually prove that the word of God is truth to people, so I started teaching it to people, and then I started getting on his salvation issues, like, you know, baptism in Jesus' name, the oneness of God, etc. And so I call their ministry up and I say, um, you know, I had questions about baptism and I said, well, I'm going to get baptized, you know, at the seven day Adventist church. And I think they baptize in Jesus name. I don't know. Does it doesn't really matter. And they're like, yes, it does matter. You got to have that power because that's where all the power is. So I, I got baptized anyway at the seven day Adventist church, but God was pricking my heart for months about, look, read the book of Acts. Every single time they were baptized, they were baptized in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. So I called their ministry up after like two months of this going on. I'm like, you know, I, where's, is there a church around here somewhere where I can get baptized the right way? And a guy knew a church in Waynesville, which is where I go to now. And so I go out there, got baptized in Jesus' name, received the Holy Ghost a week later. I mean, I was speaking in tongues for 45 minutes straight. I, couldn't, I could not speak English to save my life. Like, I was, I was just, I was scared that I could never speak English again. I was like, yeah, this is, this is crazy stuff. And so I knew, that was, I knew that was of God. I knew there was something there. I'm like, man, there's power there. And so I met my wife there, um, got married to her. I have, a, I have a kid now. He's seven months old. And, of course, um, I was a big advocate of the oneness doctrine. All right, this is where, here's my big testimony here. So through the ministry of Irvin Baxter, he, would, he had a salvation package, and he talked about the oneness of God. And, of course, I'm new to the Bible. I've I've never really read it. I read the book of Revelation, but I can't read the book of Revelation without reading the rest of the books, right? I mean, you don't know what's really going on there. 
So anyway, you know, he gets on Isaiah 9, 6, um, you know, 1 Timothy 3, 16, God was manifest in the flesh, and, you know, the Trinity's false. Um, you know, there's one God, if there's one God, and Jesus is God, which, you know, his, his premise was this. He said, there's one God, Jesus is God, therefore Jesus is God. I said, that makes complete sense. Because if you have, if Jesus is God and there's a God, you have polytheism, and that's, you know, you don't want to worship multiple gods. So, I, you know, I, I actually was a big advocate of it. And I would debate Jehovah's Witnesses, Trinitarians, you know, people that didn't agree with me. I mean, I would meet them face to face. I would go to the Kingdom Hall and debate with them about Jesus being God. You know, it just made me so furious that they could not believe this. And so, um, anyway, fast forward about a year ago, I was just minding my own business, reading the Bible, reading the book of Revelation, and I've read this so many times, but just something that night just hit me like a ton of bricks. You know Revelation 3, where Jesus says he has a God like five times? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. Jesus is God, but he has a God? And this is what I was thinking. That I wasn't coming against oneness. I'm like, what? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. How could Jesus have a God if he is God? You know, and that was going through my head for weeks. I'm like, and I couldn't get away from it. I I tried like, man, I don't want to come against this doctrine. This is I love this doctrine. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna defend it, you know. And so, you know, I'm going back and forth in my brain and just I I was praying about it because I was I was um doing an intense study on the book of Proverbs where it says you must love wisdom and understand more than gold, silver, precious rubies. And I was like, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just really study this out because I shouldn't be confused about this if this is so ironclad, you know. And so um, I was still a oneness person when I came across your ministries. You guys had a huge impact. You guys challenged me. And I, I appreciate the rebuke and the challenge that you offered to the oneness doctrine because I couldn't answer the questions that you guys are bringing up. Like, you guys brought up so many questions. that I, And I love to have logical arguments and defend stuff, but I'm like, I can't even... I don't even know where to begin. And so I just started wrestling with myself. And then you guys brought up the fact that why don't we, pr- why don't we have the language like the apostles did in the book of Acts? You know, they always talk about the son of God, G- you know, God's son. You don't ever hear a oneness person talk like that. I'm like, you're right. What's th- something's wrong here. And so I just started praying. I, I read the entire New Testament again with those lenses. And, you know, I, I went back and forth. I mean, I was... It, it was a struggle. It's not easy to come to this because, I mean, you don't touch the oneness doctrine, okay? And apostolics, you do not touch it. It's kind of like with Trinitarianism. You don't touch the doctrine of the Trinity. So, you know, I'm just going back and forth, and, you know, I'm praying for myself. I'm, I'm trying to come to this understanding myself. I, I'm listening to you guys. I'm hearing other people that have come out of this, that have come to this revelation that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, not God. And so, you know, a few months later, I'm like, yeah, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so I've been the last, I don't know, when I came to that revelation, it was some probably, probably September when you had that uh, 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 Genesis 22-3 revelation. Probably around that time, I was like, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. And so I, I, I kept it on the down low because I, I knew I would get kicked out and chastised and called a heretic. And I'm still, I'm actually not promoting it like I, I'm actually on the brink of doing it because I've been sharpening my sword, so to speak, praying, studying, trying to get the right timing because, you know, I, I have a, my wife has brought up in this her whole life and it's not easy for her. I, I told her this, you know, like back in October and it was hard. I mean, it, it made me cry. I mean, it was so hard to reveal this to her. Like, look, I'm sorry, but I don't believe that Jesus is God. He is the son of God. He's God's human son. You know, and you can't, you know, when Jesus is praying, he said that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus whom he sent. There's two people there. You're denying the true Son of God. And I cannot get away from it. I can't deny God's Son. It's just rife all throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah, I mean, there's so many passages in Isaiah and, and the whole Old Testament scriptures that they're separate persons. They can't be the same person. And so, um, but she's she's doing, you know, she's listening and she's not, She's listening. That's that's the first step, listening. And so I'm thankful for that. Um, so, and I'm just, I'm talking to God about, you know, starting something maybe in Asheville or the Waynesville area, you know, because I, I do want to start something because I, I love this truth so much that it 
it's just it's the foundation that the, I mean Peter the confession was Jesus is the Christ the son of God that's our foundation you can't go wrong when we get that right and I just want to build on that foundation I don't want to be like David was saying I don't want to build on the foundation of men you know the, the dual nature doctrine is a quicksand that sandy shaky foundation and so I don't want to build on that I want the truth and like David was saying we gotta, we gotta love truth. We cannot be saved without a love for truth. By the way, Paul says that in Thessalonians. He says you cannot, you must be saved. You must have a love of the truth to be saved. You can't be saved if you're not passionate about stuff. You can't be saved. And that, and Paul says in Timothy that he wants to everybody to come to the knowledge of the truth. And what is that? There's one God, one mediator, one God, one mediator, the man, two people. They're not the same person. I'm sorry, one is people. I love you guys, but they're not the same person. I say that humbly because I was very humbled by this. And so, um, yeah, that's where I'm at now. And, uh, you know, I'm about to reveal this to my, my people back there. And just pray for me because I'm, I'm going to be attacked. I already know it's coming. I'm, I'm prepped for it, though. I prayed about it. Guys equipped me. And so I'm, I'm just ready to glorify God and his son. So thank you, guys. Amen. We we know that step that you're getting ready to take. We've uh, we've walked that. You don't have to do it alone. You you do have friends here in Raleigh and Alabama and Rhode Island that that are ready to stand with you, pray with you. Amen. Amen. What a blessing it is to hear these testimonies this morning. So refreshing to hear this. Amen. Um, Brother Dolson Gould is no stranger. He's been with us before in person, and uh, so he's not a new face. And he's going to come and share with us this morning what's on his heart. So honored to have Brother and Sister Gould with us and the elder Brother Gould as well, um, who, who this is already his home. We've, we've already established that, right? I mean, it's, it's, just a, it's just an issue of details at this point. Yeah. Um, Amen. So he's looking forward to trying to move down this way if the Lord would allow. And um, so it, it is a blessing anytime we can fellowship with the ghouls. Brother Ghoul, please come. Tell us whatever's on your heart. Let's receive him warmly this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Hallelujah. We glorify you. Oh, we're so honored to be in this place today. Thank you, hallelujah, for your love, for your grace, for your truth. We thank you. Well, I, I, I love to open now and say grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's wonderful to be able to greet people. And, and, and leave that blessing with them. Grace and peace. Uh, those two things right there will get us through a lot of what we go through in this life. Because we need it. We need grace from our Lord Jesus Christ and from God our Father. And I just thank God for just being able to be in this place. I thank God for all of you. Uh, we, we This is the second time we've been here, but... You know, even when we were pulling in, the kids didn't really know. They just knew we were going to a hotel. That's, that's all they were excited about. But uh, when we pulled into the parking lot, they said, oh, I love this church. You know, <laughs> you know, they were just so happy to be here. And it, it, it sound, you know, that, that really brings my heart joy because, you know, we, we really had um, built a relationship. And we still have a relationship with the church that we fellowshiped with um, for the last four years. And we still fellowship with them from time to time in the sense that we'll visit and the kids will go and I'll go. And we'll, we'll, we have that love and affinity for them. Um, but it's, it's a struggle within because both parties recognize that there's a major difference between what we believe and ultimately who we worship and call our God. And, you know, I've, I've found that that relationship between people that we've known for some all our lives, for some a short time, it doesn't matter. It's, it's difficult to navigate. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful in a sense because, you know, I just had, I just had a lunch 
with the pastor. And, you know, we didn't, it's like we just kind of left this on the table and, and talked about other things. And, you know, I consider him like a father to me because when I came out of the mess that I had gotten myself in, he welcomed me. And I, I can't negate that love because I tell you what, he got a phone call. When I first came to that church, he got a phone call because uh, it, w- it was amazing how it worked out. Uh, I had a cousin, more or less, sitting in the, in the audience and didn't know it because my mother's husband is uh, the cousin to a, a sister who was a member of that church at the time. And when she saw me on Facebook with my sister who she had recognized, she said, I know, I know this, this girl who are you with in this picture? It was a, and it ended up being my sister, and she was excited about that. You know, like, oh, my goodness, we, we're almost related. But when it got back to the family who knew me, and, and you know, it's interesting because, you know, I, I identify with Paul in some ways because people knew Paul. They knew Paul when Paul was persecuting the church. They knew Paul when Paul was locking people up and having them killed for preaching this very message, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. It's interesting that's the first thing he preached when he got on his feet. But, you know, it it was like, you know, here I am back in the the saddle, so to speak, and the first thing that happens is they get a phone call that, do you know who you got in your your, uh, congregation? This guy is, this guy is bad. I mean, he's just a bad seed. And I, you know, I don't even hold that against them. Whoever it was, whatever was said, I don't hold it against it because it ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me. Because when the pastor got the phone call and got the rundown of who I was, the mess that I'd gotten myself, the person inside who I knew I had been, my wife knew I had been because she's the one that confronted me about it. But when I got, when he got that phone call and I got presented with this, it was like an open door for me. I, I let it all out. I mean, I literally just spilled the beans as they, I went back into things that I had never told anybody except my wife because I confessed everything to her from a child on up. But it was amazing because I guess that had an impact on him. And he was willing to suffer me for a while, so to speak. But he said, I see your sincerity. And for that, he let me in and let me participate. And I guess, you know, the Lord was working in me, and he could see that. And that respect was something that I had that really never had. I hadn't even had it for myself because I couldn't respect myself. I knew who I was. You know, so it's like it, it's, it's, it's complicated at times. And I, I know what you're about to go through, brother, because, you know, we separated. But I'm grateful because we separated in peace. And that's something that I, I that's, you know, it's, it's the most that I could hope for because while I would love to have everyone listen and begin to accept the very things that I didn't learn because I saw the video. I went looking for the video of, of, of the ministry of Takor because I, I, I read what the Bible said and it didn't make sense for what I was believing. And I went looking for some evidence that I wasn't crazy. <laughs> you know, and my wife can testify. I spent hours in the Bible and she would say, I hope you find what you're looking for. Because I, I mean, I would come home from work. I wouldn't even I would barely greet them. I would just get in my Bible and start reading because I, I said something is missing. There's a key piece, a piece missing to this and I, I, I need to find it, you know, and so I'm, I'm grateful. Um, so, I mean, you know, just being in the midst of you all being here. You know, it, it does my heart so much joy because I, I know that we're all family. We're all family. And we've all even more so been through some of the same things and can encourage one another. We know what it's like to lose a friend, to lose a father in the gospel, so to speak. You know, we, we know what it's like to have a relative that, that, that is saying, you're crazy. And, and then sort of treating you like, you know, you don't come this far, you're going to turn back. And, and now, you know, I'm, again, I'm blessed because I feel as though in the midst of all of this, the respect and love for the people that I have known, for the most part, still remains. 
and I'm grateful. I mean, I, I, can't, I get more flack from people that have never known me than I do from the people that actually have known me uh, all my life or for a short period of time. You know, but, you know, I, I had some things, and, and, and I've already gotten the, uh, the rap for being long. I, I can't help myself. I, I do. I do try. Even when I write sometimes, I find myself writing books as my wife says. So she said, I didn't even read the post. It was a book. You know, I find myself doing that because I just, I like to be thorough and I like to cover all the ground because I find that that's, that's one of the reasons why we've gotten into the mess that we're in. It's because we don't cover all of the ground. We, we read, my wife loves when we have our Sunday morning, when we um, fellowship with you all remotely. You know, everyone, the Lord has been leading now. Sometimes I've been led to preach, you know, in my own living room to my own family. You know, there ain't much going on there, although the Lord has opened up a door because her family has just recently, within the last month, asked for Bible study. And we've been having Bible study, praise God. You know, that was a blessing. Hallelujah. I am, I am so grateful for that. You know, it's been five years that they've been seeing us walking differently, and it, was, it took five years, but someone finally asked the question, what is it? And from that, we've been, we've been having a glorious Bible study, but uh, when, we, when we do fellowship with y'all, my wife says, I love how they always start and, like, read almost the entire chapter. You know, she likes that. For some reason, it's like all that skipping around, and she just loves being able to go right on through and cover so much of what's really being said. And I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the elders here, Takor, and the time that they take to go through and really uh, feed the people of God, what, what needs to be heard. But uh, just, just briefly, uh, there was two things I wanted to cover, and, and, and one just came as, as, as you, brother, were speaking, Brother Daniel, and, um, you know, about Jesus being the Christ, the Son of God. And, and, you know, my mind was just taken back to something I know everyone knows, but in uh, First Chronicles, the 17th chapter, um, you know, it, I, I had never seen this before, but when I finally saw it, it, it just opened my, my, uh, my understanding even more. It's amazing because there's certain things. The Old Testament is great for prophecy, and I've used it as a oneness person all my life, but there were certain things I just didn't really touch or weren't touched to where I knew them so great. But in that first uh, Chronicles, the 17th chapter, and 11th verse, when he starts, and, and Nathan is talking to David and says, uh, when your days are fulfilled, that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up one of your descendants after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build for me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And I will not take my loving kindness away from him as I took it away from him who was before you. But I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever." And I mean, when I read that the first time, I was like, oh, my goodness. It was after I had come to this understanding, but I was like, wow, what a prophecy. You know, what a, what a great prophecy spoken, you know, to, you know, speak of who Christ was. And, and uh, what I found more interesting, though, is because when Jesus presented this question to the Pharisees, he said, whose son was Christ? It's like no one, even, even the Pharisees who, who was negating, who were negating who he was, their answer was quick because they understood that prophecy. The Messiah would be David's son. But when he asked them, then why did David call him Lord? They couldn't understand what David himself spoke when he spoke in Psalms 1, 10, and 1, when he prophesied and said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou 
at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. They, they couldn't make that connection. And I, I think maybe some of them could, but they knew if they did what they would be saying. But what really brought it out for me is on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached it. He let us know why David called him his son, Lord. Because it's like David understood that God calling his son, God's son, was going to put him on a level much higher than where he was. The kingdom that God had chosen David to lead and ultimately his seed, if God was going to choose one of his seed to sit not just in David's throne, but ultimately be inherited God's throne, then he was going to be greater than David. And David, recognizing that, could say, my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord. And when Peter put that so plainly and said that God, hath made that same Jesus that Peter started out talking about he was a man approved of God. God made that same Jesus both Lord and Christ. It's like, oh, I get it. This is what, this is all about recognizing that Jesus is indeed our Lord. He's our Christ. He's our Messiah, the the greatest king that has ever lived, died, and been risen again and now lives forevermore and I got that same promise if I believe in him and I believe in truly that he is my my messiah you know and that it just it did something to me you know I'm not a big movie guy uh I've almost you know it's like I I notice that sometimes when we come into certain uh truths and 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 we make certain shifts in our life um we we kind of have a tendency at times, speaking people like me, I'm, I'm like what they call an extremist. You can like dump everything. It's like, okay, there's a bunch of stuff I'm just going to dump. You know, uh, I, I remember I, I was a huge musician growing up. I played music in the church all my life, played the bass, played the, the drums. I wanted to play the organ. That was like the one thing that, you know, the Lord just almost didn't let me because I think if I had gotten a hold of that, it, it would, I, would, I just would have been worse because there's a lot that goes with that. But you know, when I, I remember I went to, to DR with my wife and, and visited her family, and I went to a church, and they had a tambourine, and that's all they had. And the worship that took place, I mean, when the songs was being sung, and I, I couldn't even understand them real good because it was Spanish, but it was just like I said, I don't want pl- to play another instrument. I don't even want to hear any more music. I just want to hear singing. I just, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm such an extreme. I just dumped it all. And, you know, the same thing happened when I came back to the Lord when I was 35. And, you know, I started watching movies. And it was like, I remember watching one of my favorite movies. And I said, this is nothing but the devil. And it was like, it was, you know, my favorite movie. I said, why do I even like this? What women want. That man is nothing but a, 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 a devil. He just wants to take advantage of women. I'm never watching this again. And it's like, all of a sudden, the TV was like, that's the devil, you know, for me. And I mean, I done got to the point we... We done took it out of our home, and we have the, the, the actual tube, but we just, we don't have cable, we don't have internet. It's like, you know, if it ain't, if it ain't on DVD, we ain't watching it. And we, we only have as cartoons, you know? But, you know, I was watching, I, 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 you know, we, we do from time to time, we'll go rent something. And uh, I decided, I heard someone talking about Ben-Hur and wanting to watch Ben-Hur. And I said, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll take a look at that. I, I'd never really seen the original, and I, you know, all the talk about original versus the, the new stuff. And I watched the movie only because I heard someone say, you know, it took place in the time of Christ. I said, ooh, that might be interesting. You know, that's the only reason it was even interesting for me. But I, as I'm watching it, and it was enjoyable to a degree, but at that very last scene of the latest one, Jesus is on the cross cross and you know uh ben hur is there when he has this rock that he was going to hit one of the, the 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 centurions that were uh guiding jesus along the, the the path leading up to you know when they were going to nail him up and put him on the cross and he was actually going to hit hit one of the guards because they denied jesus a drink of water that's what they showed in the movie and, you know, Jesus, you know, in this movie, they, they depict Jesus kind of telling them, no, don't do it. But he holds on to the rock because he's mad. He's consumed with fury 
and wrath. Because it's not about him knowing who Jesus was. It's about the takeover of the Roman government. And he recognized this man is peaceful. But at this time, he had been through so much, he just had wrath working in him all the way around. And, and he had just won back his freedom because he went through this thing with chariot racing and all that for those who have watched the movie. But when, when Jesus is up there and, and, and he's just looking in astonishment like, this peaceful man was crucified like that? But at this very scene, they show Jesus saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And at that moment, they, they, they pan to him and he gets this look in his face and he drops the rock. And he just begins to weep. And I mean, I must have, I must have started up my wife because I started weeping. Because at that moment, it had nothing to do with the movie. But I realized what Jesus had actually done. I realized that this man, e e even on the cross, he forsook his own righteousness. He didn't belong up there. He hadn't done anything to deserve it and had the right to say, you know what? I hope all of y'all burn in hell for what y'all done. My father's going to pour his wrath out on y'all and y'all going to get it. Because I'm going to tell you what, if, 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 that, if I was in that position, I mean, if, 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 I had, if my father was a millionaire and, a, and, and some cop pulls me over and is not acting right, I'm going to be like, you know who my dad is? You better act right because he's going to get you. So, I mean, to have Jesus up there and, and to see him, you know, ask for, he, he relinquishes even his own righteousness that he himself could have, could have gloried in that I don't deserve to be up here. I hope all of you suffer. No, I, you know what? I recognize that God's will is greater than anything else. And it's his will, so you know what? I'm okay, and I hope he doesn't hold what you're doing to fulfill his will against you. That, that, that right, right there within me, it made me realize what he conquered. He became my Messiah for the struggle within me. My feelings, my emotions, the things within me that I realize Jesus had to feel. I realized that when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, I am grieved to the point of death. He felt that. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I want to take the time. I didn't want to do it, but I, I want to read Psalm 22. If, if it's okay, it's, it's okay. Psalm 20, 22. And it's like I, I, I was listening to this on the way up and it's just like this is this is literally you know uh, Peter says something that's totally taken out of context but he says that um, the spirit of Christ in the prophets he's saying testified beforehand of the suffering of Christ well this is one of those times where a prophet who is David at this point is testifying beforehand of the suffering of Christ He's testifying right here, and he says, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest, yet you are holy. My God. It's like, I'm not, oh, I'm, I'm expressing how I feel, but I'm not going to lay it against you. I'm not going to charge you foolishly because I recognize you are holy. Oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were delivered. In you, they trusted and were not disappointed. But I'm a worm. And not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They are separate with lip. They separate with the lip. They wag their head saying, commit yourself unto the Lord. Let him deliver him. 
he let him rescue him because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. It's like he's, he's recognizing how he feels. He's recognizing everything that's going on around him. But he's not charging God. He's not being foolish. Reminds me of Job a little bit in, in, in what appeared to be how he felt. I, that was a beautiful message. But it's something that, that I, I saw so long ago. It's like, why don't we get to the end? I'm sorry. I just had to go there. Job was a great guy, but we have to read the end. But, you know, uh, David continues and he says, um, you made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you, I was cast from birth. You have been my God for my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a raveling and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, and a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look. They stare at me. I mean, this, I'm just reading through it because I don't want to take the time. But we know that this is, this is exactly the mind of Jesus Christ when he is going through this time period of being crucified. We can, we can read this and almost picture in our minds him saying this within himself. So he felt this. This was a real feeling. This wasn't just a portrayal of, of you know, well, you know, it's kind of like prophetic, just showing. No, no, no. David's almost speaking basically his words. And to a point, Christ speaks a part of this. And so we can see the parallel. But it's almost as David is prophesying and giving us an insight into the very mind of Jesus while he's up there. I just want to continue. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far. You are, you, O my, O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth from the horns of the wild oxen, you answer me. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. The, the Hebrew writer quotes that when he talks about Jesus in that second chapter of Hebrews. But it, it, it gave me the understanding that Jesus, as a man, felt the same way I feel as a man when I go through things. I begin to realize that it's my emotions that actually can take me down a road that I did not intend to go through. I thought about Cain when his countenance fell and he got angry. Now, he didn't do what was the right and that in God's eyes and God, God let him know and he didn't have respect to his offering. But Cain got mad at it. But but God actually took the time to talk to him like a father would. My son doesn't do what I want and he knows that I'm not happy. He might get mad. But you know what? I said, come on, son. Now, look, you know, if you do what I want you to do, I'll be happy with you. But if you don't, look, you're going to get in a whole bunch of trouble because what's going to happen what you're going to do is going to cause you and cause others a whole lot of grief. 
God does this with Cain. Cain don't pay attention. And we know what happens next. But I realized that that emotion, that overwhelming emotional uh, uh, just strain and drain on, on, on my very character can take me to a place that I'm willing to do something I know I shouldn't do. It's like the spirit of God in me is leading me out of where I feel I want to go. And I'm saying, no, nah, but no, 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 I'm tired. I done told my wife a million times. No, I'm not going to back down this time. I always use her for an example because, I mean, you know, I don't really have anyone else. But it's like that close relationship that we have at times and the things that we go through and my children and some people at work even, I realize that it's my emotion that tries to get the best of me. And in times past, no one had a deliverance. It's almost like my true character comes out when my emotions take over. I have the ability through self-will and discipline and law to live a certain kind of way until my emotions get me. I can present myself in a certain way whenever I need to in front of people. Um, I, I even, you know, some people say, oh, you, 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 you don't mind speaking. I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't have a fear necessarily of, of presenting myself, but you get my emotions going. Let something happen and I feel emotional about it. Now I have a struggle because I know the appearance that I must maintain, but I also know what I want to do and it doesn't fit that appearance. I know how I feel about what has just happened, but it doesn't fit the appearance of the person that everyone else knows me to be. And, and it's the person I want people to know me to be. I want people to look at me and know me as the guy that, that's on Facebook writing such long uh, uh, posts and being so patient. But the truth is, there's times when I feel like writing, you know what? You know, you, you, you're lost. You're a lost cause. Forget this. I'm done talking to you. And just because that's how I'm, and I'm saying, this feeling doesn't fit my character. But when I realized that Jesus was able to submit himself against his own feelings to his God and carry out what God wanted him to do, I realized that's it. That is the enemy, or at least one of the major enemies that I've been dealing with. It's easy to suffer without, I believe, at times. It's like I imagine in my mind, if someone was to come in and say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, and take me down, put me in a cellar somewhere and beat me. Confess it. Uh, renounce your belief. I'm like, no, I feel, this is, this is it. It's like I feel like I'm in the height of glory. I'm, I'm standing for the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to let down for anything. They want to they kill me. I'm gonna, oh, I believe in Jesus. I'm not going to renounce that. But at the, at the supermarket, when someone runs their heel, you know, they caught up against my heels, and I'm like, excuse me, and they do it again, and I'm like, excuse me, and they say, what? I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to show you some Jesus now. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, you want to oh, you wanna see Jesus? Why don't we step out in the parking lot, bro? <laughs> oh, you doing it on purpose? You know, it's like, wait, it was so easy when I was captured, and I realized when we are, uh, when we are held in a position by which we cannot move, that is a completely different situation than we are held in a position where we have the freedom to move. I'm a little guy. I'm going to tell you right now. But my brother here is big. If I try to wrap him around a chair and I can imagine him going, Rah! like Samson, you know, and just breaking it free, I'm going to have a struggle. But see, if I, if I wrap him up in a chair, and I, I barely put anything on him. And then I take a pin and I begin to prick him and poke him and irritate him. For him to sit in that chair and take that, when he has the freedom to just get up and walk out of it, that's, it's like that takes more than if I really bound him to a position where he couldn't move and now I'm doing the same thing. And it's like I want to move, but I can't. And I realize Jesus could have come down off the cross. Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane and said, you know what? 
if, if you can take this cup, take it. But not my will be done. Yours, Father. Now that's real. Because he's feeling the grief that anyone would feel if you know the very thing that you, I mean, Jesus has been saying all the time, you know, for this reason, you know, I'm, I'm he's telling his disciples that he's come to die and they're rebuking him and he's rebuking them. It's like, you know, I, I'm going to do this. But when the, when the hour came, it was too much. It was like it was too much to bear. But he got it, a hold of his feelings and he sacrificed them himself. Through the eternal spirit, he crucified himself. It's like that he let the grace of God that was upon him, he tastes death for every man. This is what the Bible says. So it's like I realized that the grace of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ abiding abundantly in my life can help me take my feelings Help me take my emotions. And when I realize that my Messiah has already conquered this, and if I can surrender myself to him, then he comes in and he fights that battle for me. And now I'm able, I'm actually able to live a certain way because even the agony, I had someone ask me, okay, okay, I get it. We're supposed to live a certain way, but... But how do we get there? And it was like, it's like the Lord just put, we have to crucify it. Our flesh, that's, and some people say, well, I can't. No, no, the emotions and the lusts that are within this flesh, those emotions, those feelings, those thoughts that come because of the, the, the reality of the things that are happening to us. But we're really taking What's going on within our minds, the thoughts that are, you know, just turning, the emotions. And we're, it's like at that very moment, Satan say, look at me. Don't look at God. Look at me. Your situation is bleak, brother. Your situation is not looking good. And if you don't look at me, you're going to find yourself in a situation where that you are going to be completely consumed. And so I, I'll read one more, I, you know, I, I, could, I can't resist. But the 13th chapter of Psalm spoke to me. The 13th division says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I realized that when Isaiah says no weapon formed against me shall prosper. It's like at that moment, now I'm realizing, okay, wait, the weapon is formed and it's even used against me maybe. But the reason it won't prosper is because even in death, as long as I have not surrendered my will to myself, but I have continued to surrender my will to God, then the weapon didn't do what it was intended to do because the whole reason why I was shaken, the whole reason why the enemy came amongst me and tried to really, you know, jostle me out of the position God has placed me in, the reason why I'm feeling so much emotion and I feel like running and, and fighting and cussing and doing everything within me is working. And I'm saying, God, where's my deliverance? At that moment, I realized, wait, if I continue here, I'm, that's my suffering. That's my suffering. When I know I'm in the right and I know that if I just, if I come, if I push this point, they're going to see it. They're going to see it. No, I'm going to let it go because this is what the Lord's will is at this very moment. And it's like, wow, when I suffer my emotions, when I suffer the lust of my flesh to rise up 
and fight because I am raging mad at this point. Now I'm identifying with Jesus Christ. Now I'm identifying with having the ability to do something, having the strength to do it, but literally relinquishing my will, relinquishing my power. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He learned, I have the right as a son. God called me his son. He really spoke from heaven twice. And we still don't hear him, but that's a whole nother thing. But I'm not going to use that to my advantage. I'm not going to use my ability to get out of something. I'm going to relinquish my will. And that's, that's, that's powerful. And so I just want to, I wanted to leave that with everyone today. There, there, there's, there's, a, there's a passage that I'll, I'll refer to more than just read. But I know everyone here likes to read. Everyone here likes to read their Bibles. I like that. So I'm, I'm going I to, I don't feel too bad. As long as I stay in the book, I feel good. I, I feel like I'm welcome. I'm welcome. You know, I, I hear all the time where we'll be listening at home and uh, Elder Brantley will say, you know, more, more so than any of the other elders. I hear Elder Brantley saying, ah, OK, I know y'all tired of me now. You know, I'm saying, no, keep going. We're sitting at home. Of course, we're sitting at home. Right. And we're watching. But I mean, I'm just, it's just so good. You don't want it to end. You know, truth is good. If it, when, you weren't, when you're being edified, it feels good when you can reflect on your life through the words that are spoken and you can see where, okay, I need to let, I need to let that go. I need to let go of this. That feels good. Or, oh, wow, okay, I'm doing that. I'm doing good here. Oh, I, I believe. Okay. You get confirmation. You get rebuke. You get reproof. It feels great. So I, I never want it really to end, but I realize that it must after a while. Even the, even the children at home get restless, you know. But in, in Philippians, that third chapter, you know, I, I like the NSAB version because I feel like it, it really brings out the part that I really, that really stuck out to me. Because he says that, uh, this, is, this is Paul speaking, in that third uh, chapter, starting at the seventh verse, he says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And, and, and we all I know those of us who have have listened to Elder Brantley preach on being in Christ. We know what that really means. But he goes on to say, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, or in our case, derived from what we know we should do. But he goes on, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, and if anything if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also, or also to you. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. That's what my brother was talking about just earlier. It's like living up to what we know. But I, I love how, how Paul just talks about, listen, 
I recognize, not in that I'm not doing the right thing, I'm doing the right thing. I go to church. We have church in our house. I don't even need to show up to the building. We make time in the house to have it. I'm praying every morning. I'm making sure I don't watch certain things. I I have a list of do's and do nots that I'm keeping to. But within me, those things don't make me righteous. Those things don't actually cure the feeling and emotion that rises up in me when I'm placed in a situation. But my faith in Jesus Christ, being my Messiah, being my Savior, being the one who is able to do within me, that fourth chapter of Hebrews into the fifth chapter really speaks to it for me. He's able to do in me something that me, myself, when I'm in the midst of a situation, I cannot do. So I, I just wanted to leave that thought. It was, it was burning in my, I mean, it, obviously there's much more. And I, 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 could, I could probably go on for another hour. I, I think I could probably match Elder Brantley in, in, in boring everybody. I could because I get it. From, I even get it at home. You know, I have, to, I have to be told, okay, okay. I think I got the signal. I already got the signal. But, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the things that have been deposited, not only from this ministry, but even the ministry I left. I'm grateful for everyone that has deposited truth in me. Everybody doesn't have all of it. I'm still seeking to get a firm understanding. My dad says something almost every day on Facebook. He says, Father, what they had in 33 AD, today in 2017. And that is so true. Because how much of this is lost due to all of the apostasy that we have gone through since the days of the apostles. But striving and pressing every day. I haven't obtained the perfection that I have been obtained for. I haven't gotten what I've been seek, what I myself have been retained for, what I have been called for. I've been called to live holy, and I'm, I'm doing what I know is right, but I'm talking about that pure, righteous perfection on the inside has not yet taken place, but I'm pressing. I'm pressing. I'm pressing through my emotions. I'm pressing through my anger. I'm pressing through my sadness. I'm pressing through my grief. I'm pressing through my loneliness. I'm pressing through everything that I feel, and I'm making sure that none of that gets in the way. And that's important for us. So I just want to encourage you all. I'm grateful for the time that you gave me to speak, and I hope that, you know, I did okay. I know I'll hear it from my wife a little bit later. You know, she'll tell me my, my time, my time. But God bless you all, Elder Brantley. Amen. Stand with me, if you will. We need to pray because the word that he just gave us is a word from God. And our spirits, our souls have got to be sanctified totally to crucify not only the, the, the flesh, but its lust and its affections as well. We need to pray about this. So I want to open these altars right now for those of you who would join me. Just find a place wherever you're comfortable. And let's let's spend some time not only being hearers of the word, but praying that God would give us strength and direction to be doers of the word. I want to apply this word to my life. Father, we come before you with humility, receiving with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. And we commit ourselves to start prayer right now. Prayer that's going to to last long after this service is over with. But Father, we pray that this word the seed of your word that is being planted in our hearts and in our minds. Father, we receive that with meekness, with gladness. Wash us. Purge us. Purge our spirit. Purge our conscience from these dead works. Come on, child of God, lift your voice. Ask God on behalf of your own self. We are pursuing perfection. We count not ourselves to have apprehended, but this one thing we do, we press towards that mark of that high calling which is in Christ Jesus. A pure spirit, an extraordinary spirit. 
We seek you right now, Father.